Rose Red is a haunted house story, and uh, I'd like it to be uh, a sort of Moby Dick of haunted house stories, if you will. That is to say, I'd, I'd like it to be uh, something that's big and scary that sticks in people's minds is the haunted house movie. Rose Red is the name of a house that is uh, a very famous house in the story because uh, it was built at the turn of the century by uh, the Rimbauers, a very wealthy couple and uh, it has, I guess what you might call, a curse on it in that uh, uh, the house keeps building itself and Ellen, during her lifetime, kept building the house to keep herself alive. I play a woman who's a professor, present day professor, who gathers a team of um, psychics and telekinetics together to go into the house and try to wake it up and bring out all the hauntings and dead people and paranormal activity. Here we are in lovely Seattle, Washington. Isn't it gorgeous? But little do these people understand what's about to happen to them. 800 people are going to descend on this city to make a six-hour miniseries for ABC called Stephen King's Rose Red. Steven Spielberg came to me back, I think, in 1996 and said, I'd like to make the scariest uh, haunted house movie ever. Would you write it? And uh, I said, yeah, I'd take a shot at it. And then I think Spielberg, you know, went and did, uh, a, a, you know, something else. And, and then a couple years went by and I got a call. Uh, actually, it was the, the, really the week before Steve got hit in this horrible accident in uh, Maine that, that, that summer. And he said I, he was thinking about um, another project for ABC. I was to send the... Uh, you know, to get the script to Craig Baxley to take a look at over the weekend. And that Saturday, the next day, he got hit by the truck. So, um, it was like six months. And the first thing he really addressed, um, once he recovered, uh, was Rose Red. Well, they, sh they should watch Rose Red because if it's a failure, I won't get to do another one. <laughs> He embraces your thoughts, your ideas, and he knows what you're trying to do is to achieve something that uh, uh, maybe no other filmmakers can do. And I think with the team we had on Rose Red, uh, he trusted us. He knew what we accomplished on Storm of the Century, and here we were again. i got to tell you, it was one of the most exciting uh, uh, experiences I've had in the business. When I was sent a script by Stephen King, I knew it meant quality. I knew it would be exciting and interesting. and. Uh, and even though I knew there would be an element of horror, I also know that Stephen is a master storyteller and really uh, writes interesting characters and relationships. And even though this is about a haunted house, it, it has very interesting relationships between each of the characters and unusual relationships. In this genre, a lot of people you know, say, oh, it's TV. Um, I, I don't buy into that. And I, I think a lot of filmmakers, uh, frankly, are a little uh, um, maybe insulted by that because I think you can do great quality work in television. I think it's being done all the time and I think what we're doing here uh, echoes that. I've had a great relationship with ABC over the years that's built up since it. They've done a number of mini-series of my books and while some of my books have fit pretty well in that movie format, uh, even when it works well with a movie like The Green Mile or The Shawshank Redemption, they have a tendency to run along because I'm more of a putter-inner than a taker-outer. And for that reason, for me, the miniseries format is perfect. It gives me a chance to tell novels in basically a different medium and to reach a larger audience. We're up here for four months. Um, it's, uh, we're working most every day, and um, it, it does come, become a part of your life. Well, you're, you're cramming a lot in in four months. I mean, you think that you shoot a two-hour feature in 
four months and here we are shooting essentially three features in four months. Normally if you get a script and uh, the, uh, the, the writer writes a larger scene or a larger, uh, has a, a larger expectation than what you could normally do for the budget uh, that you get for television, you make compromises, you make cuts. Uh, when Mr. King hands you a script, it's basically the written word remains. Whatever Mr. King writes, that's what you're going to make. I wear a number of hats in Rose Red, as I did in Storm of the Century or The Shining. And the first one that I always put on is writer. And the writer doesn't worry about the budget or the expense or the headache of how people are going to put it together. Then you put on your executive producer's hat, and then you have to worry about the budget. We start uh, doing the drawings, a lot of drawings in the beginning, a lot of sketches and things. and. And we, I like to get into models quickly, so um, I go a lot from architectural drawings into models. And, uh, and then we photogra actually photographed the models uh, at one point and sent them to, to, to Stephen King for him to look at and for the director and everybody to look at and get approval from them. People who hear about the story uh, who are familiar with uh, the Winchester Mystery House in San Jose, California, often comment on the similarity uh, of, of this story to or rather the story of the building of uh, Rose Red to the story of the building of the Winchester Mystery House. Which supposedly uh, the widow of the Winchester pow pow, you know, the rifle magnate said, uh, this, this psychic said to the widow, as long as you're not done building the house, you, you'll stay alive. That is, you won't die until the house is done. And so what she decided was, that she would never be done building the house and therefore she would never die. And so what I liked about it was the idea of a house that starts to build itself. We started looking all over the United States and Canada and we were shown Thornwood Castle and Lakewood which was nearly perfect. As Steve said to me when, when uh, he first sent the script, he said, I'd like to find a house that is user friendly. I mean, as opposed to a, a house that immediately upon seeing it, you say, well, this is a haunted house. It should not look haunted. It should look kind of warm and inviting. It only becomes uh, haunted when you become aware of, as it grows on you. The first objective was to find an exterior that worked. Um, we spent months trying to locate a house that would work and give us all the, uh, the elements we needed to make it work with the interior, which we were going to design. And uh, the only place we found was uh, in uh, Tacoma, which was Thornwood. In Rose Red, uh, uh, Craig Baxley's genius at putting together uh, uh, disparate locations and making them cut together as though they were the same uh, is most evident in the fact that we see Rose Red as though it were in the middle of downtown uh, Seattle. We see it under construction during that time, we see people arrive and depart there, and you would swear, because of the way it's shot, that this house is in downtown Seattle. Seattle itself was used for some city street filming and some house filming that you'll see in the first night's episode anyway. And the balance of our interiors, we built sets at Sandpoint Naval Air Station, which is just north of Seattle. My idea, when I got the idea, would be that we would have some fabulous sets and we would have a chance to do some really freaky things where you would have staircases that would go to nowhere, or you'd have a perspective hall where people walking down it would look big at one end and small at the other end, that there would even be a room or a corridor that was upside down, like the Poseidon Adventure, like the ship and that. So I had the tremendous fun in my imagination of building all this stuff, but it doesn't cost you anything in your imagination. Um, luckily for us, we had Craig Stearns. Craig had to, from Los Angeles, come up here and hire the construction crew. At one point we had over 400 carpenters on our crew uh, from all over the western part of the United States. We started construction in May of 2000 and uh, we started filming the sets in October of that year. So it took from May till October to get them constructed and get them dressed and ready for us to start filming. My mouth just hung open. I couldn't believe it. And, uh, and I, I just I wanted to know where they got these contractors because it went up really quickly and expediently. And, um, but it is, it's an amazing set. Uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to work on. It's like a playground for actors. Oh, money's always an object of these things. So um, it started up and uh, we built it and we designed it and then things had to be cut and things were brought down and made smaller and decisions were made. Uh, 
but I was very happy because even though things were cut back, I don't think it people will really notice, or I think it still has a grand. Luckily, when you read the script, he always puts in these little little phrases in each when, he, when you come into a set, so that's wonderful. I've done a couple of his shows, and it's wonderful because he doesn't give you a ton of information, so he doesn't want to boggle you down with a lot of detail, but he gives you a, a little phrase here, a little phrase there uh, that sort of gives you an essence of, of what he's thinking. Um, the one thing I got from him is that he wanted to feel that the house was warm and not, when you first walk in, even though it's foreboding, he doesn't want, didn't want it to be a cold, really cold place. So we stuck with warmer colors, warmer stone and, and warm woods and, and wa warmer wallpapers. We wanted it to be a haunted house that was sort of, sort of attractive, that sort of drew you in rather than something that was, was uh, cold like a mausoleum. This is a, a huge set. And walking around, it's very easy to get lost. I don't know, it's sort of like, it's it's wonderful when you read something and then you actually see the sets and it's exactly what you had in mind. Each one of the rooms, has, it's a little baby to me, so I, I love each, each and every one of them for different reasons. Um, the parlor, the main parlor was the one that I put the most effort in because I knew we were going to spend a lot of time shooting in there, so I try to try to put the most detail in the places we're going to spend the most time. So there's a lot of little hand-carved details and things that are in it that... Uh, I think really make it special and feel like it's not a set, like it's a real place. It's kind of neat being being able to walk in this big, you know, hangar and being able to be going to this set, and it's just, it's amazing. But it's it, it fits the story. It really does. It's cool. But then we recognize we we're going to have to spend a huge amount of money to create uh, the world that Steve Steve had written. And um, having done that, then we had to figure out how much money we had left over to pay the actors, you know, because it's in a sense the tail wagging the dog. As I, as I said, I mean, the, the, we, we, we were able to put together, I think, a magnificent cast. I wasn't over familiar with the cast, but um, I certainly am now. We've spent a long time here. But happy time, you know, good time. Well, I played Joyce Reardon, who is a, uh, a college professor who teaches uh, the psychology of the uh, occult and um, the science of the occult, I guess. And uh, I have this fascination with Rose Red, with this house, and believe that um, we call it a dead cell, so the, the hauntings in it are, are over, but I want to awaken that house. So I collect a team of psychics and telekinetics and others, and we come in and try to awaken the house. Wait until you see the mad sequences. It'll. Uh it's scary. It's really scary. And the best way to put it is um, she thinks she knows it all and really she's quite an innocent and then um, maybe gets a taste of her own medicine. Uh, the character I play is Stephen Rimbauer. He's a um, the last of the uh, Rose Red family that's uh, alive today. He is dating uh, Joyce, played by Nancy Travis, um, he's sort of trapped in this nightmare of uh, like a haunted past, which is the haunted house. Annie's um, a 15 year old autistic telekinetic, so she doesn't talk a lot, she's um, autistic in the sense she doesn't interact with people, she's very, um, doesn't give a lot of eye contact, but um, She's telekinetic, so she's not really scared of things, and if she wants, if she gets angry at something, she makes stuff happen. Like, she got mad and um, it made the, the water freeze in the house, and so just, she's effective in that way. Well, I think the fact that she's called sister kind of describes her better than anything can. She's sort of, that's been her role in life, is to be Annie's sister. She's very caring and she's very sweet. I say, Steve, are you okay? A lot. And also I say, Annie, are you okay? Because I'm always worried that they both are okay. I'm like a, a caretaker, like a nanny and a caring person who wants to be sure everyone is safe. Because I'm not a psychic, so I, I can't do anything useful for, by awakening the ghost, so I just look after everyone who goes through the trauma. <laughs> My character, Nick Hardaway, um, is the, uh, is, I mean, all these people are somewhat enigmatic, but he possibly is the most enigmatic. He's a sort of, um, you know, secret agent figure, James Bond figure, who's drifted into this psychic underworld. He, in his own way, is, is dryly funny. Uh, he's also 
Uh, I hope, romantic and heroic. Emery, um, let's say he's a postcognate. He sees things um, after they happen. Um, uh, spirits appear to him. He's kind of the complaining sourpuss of the, of the movie. He's kind of the squeaky wheel, always complaining. And he's, I th hopefully he's the kind of character that you hate, but you enjoy hating. Kathy's very religious, and yet she can automatic write. Well, you get, you know, you, you're possessed. People speak through you, but rather than your mouth moving, then your hand takes over. And that was a little wearing day after day to be a frump church mouse, yeah. you know, and have Matt Kiesler and Matt Ross and Julian Sands and, and Kevin Teig, you know, I've like had a thing for him for several years, more than we're going to say on camera. <laughs> when I saw that there was a chance to work with Kevin Teig again, uh, I jumped at it. He's a wonderful actor, and he's probably as uh, focused and tenacious as I am about uh, achieving what we're after. And it was a real pleasure working with him. My psychic ability is that I'm a touch now, which means that when I touch things, um, I can, I'll know what happened to that object before, who owned them, uh, anything traumatic or exciting that's happened to it. My character changes, so I'm at first like a kind of quiet, shy, mousy psychic, and then I kind of turn. Ellen Rimbauer is this amazing character that Mr. King wrote that um, this is my house. It was built for the occasion of my wedding. And so at 20, we arrive at the house, but the house isn't quite completed. We have a seance here in the dining room. And during the seance, I learn that when the house is complete, I will move on to the afterlife and that really scares me. And at 20, not really what I want to do with my life. I think a lot of viewers of these things have come to look for me. It's kind of in the spirit of those Where's Waldo books. They keep wondering where Steve King is gonna pop up. And I don't want to say exactly where I show up in Rose Red. All I can say is if you watch it very closely, sooner or later, you will see my award-winning performance. David Dukes, our actor who played Professor Miller, passed away here in Seattle on location, very suddenly, very tragically. Uh, we had filmed about two-thirds of his work, and he was magnificent. And he died uh, on the tennis court here. And so we had, uh, not only were we all shaken by this, and very affected by this, we had to admit, do some major accommodations uh, to fill in the one-third of the work that we hadn't filmed yet. And Stephen rewrote his part for the ending, and uh, we expanded a role of a local actress here, Emery's mother, Laura Kinney, and uh, that worked out very well too, but we all missed David Dukes and his wonderful influence on the set. We were able to work around the fact that, uh, Mr., uh, that David Dukes was no longer available to us for close-ups, we used stuntman, uh, we used uh, uh, a face double, we used voice doubles, and uh, we reused some old footage and made it work out. A fallen comrade um, asked not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. And um, so it's, it's about as big a reality check as you can experience um, <clears throat> in any part of your life, um, but certainly at the heart of your working life. Our special effects team, which were all local people, were just terrific and did a magnificent job in building those rigs and making those special effects work. They all had to be augmented with visual effects later on, electronically, uh, but it turned out extremely well. One, two, three, four. The key to any good action sequence is good prep, as we all know, and we had a great storyboard artist, Rick Newsom, that uh, I spent a lot of time with and I gave thumbnails to, and we we've, uh, were able to, to um, convey to the producers and the other filmmakers what the vision was, and I think when they all saw what we came up with, everybody got very excited. And rather than just um, uh, 
play on the opening sequence, which again is, I think, a, a classic unto itself that Stephen wrote, we kind of embellished on the final climactic sequence, which I think when you see it, uh, you're going to be as amazed as I am. To this day when I see it, I'm, I'm pretty amazed. I think that the thing that I most want to see cut together, I've seen some dailies that are fabulous, uh, and it was Craig Baxley's idea. Uh, there's a statue of Ellen Rimbauer in the Garden of Rose Red, and at one point the statue comes to life, reaches up, and pulls off its own face, and turns around like that. I'm looking forward to seeing that. But with their hands, it's easier to dust, but the thing is, yeah. And back in the right there. Yeah, that crooked jaws. It's not really quick. Back it up. One, two, three. It's not so much the visual effects that say echo the fantasy world, but uh, it's, it's more of the supernatural. And my concern was that uh, we didn't lose the audience. And so I'm trying to keep it grounded in reality, trying to keep it uh, as horrific as it can be for the audience. I'm trying to make the audience part of it versus uh, on the outside looking in at these big visual effects set pieces. We had about 300 and I guess it's close to 350 shots in the show. I think maybe. Um, Probably a half to a third of those, I think, are ones where again they're gonna, you know, they're gonna have feedback for people. They're gonna say, "Wow, what was that?" But a lot of it is stuff that I hope is just going to, you know, just people say, "What a lovely movie overall." Mirror Library was a lot of fun. Again, um, she's supposed to sink down into, you know, into this sort of mercury surface. It's not that hard to create a mercury surface in computer graphics, but what's tough is getting the performance of someone working in it. So we built a little custom swimming pool kind of a thing for her to wade through and splash in. We found, uh, Ron Lehman found a sort of a super uh, scotch guard that we could throw on her clothing so it wouldn't get wet and would kind of buoy up. And um, I think if I remember correctly, we shot it, it was about 30 degrees in there. Um, she was wearing, you know, I think, I think, Basically, yeah, I don't think she had any protective clothing on, so we had to have her wade back and forth several times. Again, she was a damn good sport on it. Right. Emery's mom through the mirror. Love that shot. Um, so it's a couple of sequences. Again, the mom comes out through the mirror, grabs Emery, tries to drag him back and forth. They fight back and forth here. So you have to have a believable reflection. Now, the classic way of doing that back before OSHA was, Cocteau did this, take a pool of mirror of, of mercury, lay it down on the table, people put their hands into the mercury, you get the reflection, you get the nice little stuff going, they die. Um, 
we obviously couldn't do that so we wound up having to take like two mirrors one of them shooting the main action one of them sort of in the place where this mirror's reflection would be therefore a mirror from that will be taking the reflected element and seaming the two together um it's kind of a, a nerd pleasure but it was a lot of fun working that out and and placing the two together and i think in a lot of ways, the, the effects that we get out of that are kind of the most satisfying to me in the whole movie when Mom goes back and there's Emery's face coming out at her. Craig Stearns and Mike Joyce worked very closely to design exactly what, you know, lay down a floor plan for what Rose Red would have been had he had a gazillion dollars to build the full thing. and. Essentially, yeah, just built built the rest of the house, built the rest of the grounds, um, just miniature. Rock dropping, I think, was the most fun of the entire show. We had, you know, as you know, we had this huge miniature stage. Mike Joyce and the guys had built all of these very large-scale, very fragile miniatures, filled them with beautiful, fragile furniture, put beautiful, fragile glass in. And then we got to spend about a week picking up rocks about the size of a watermelon and just literally crashing them down into those beautiful, fragile little things. It was just such a release. Mike Joyce, who is uh, probably the best in the industry, uh, did a phenomenal job with the miniatures. And I think the uh, seamless um, nature of how we combine physical production with the miniature production and the visual effects, uh, again, the key was to ground it in reality. And I think we were successful in that. We had the, you know, the, the great big courtyard, because of course there's no building as such it was as big as rose red so we've also got all the exterior stuff that kind of establishes the house before we smash it up and then the large scale stuff to break up the hallway and the bedroom and the i don't know you know pretty much every 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 room that was on the set wound up getting a miniature and getting rocks kicked through it you know the message that i try to send in all these things is nobody's really safe nobody gets off home free so that I think that if they believe they know how things are going to turn out, they're going to be very surprised. Let's put it this way, not all the good people make it through.